Uh, my name is okay. My my name is Edward Carpenter, and I'm at San Francisco State University, the Estuarine and Ocean Science Center. At the time in 1971, when I uh, discovered the plastics in the Sargasso Sea, I was at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I was on a research cruise on the um, vessel, the Atlantis, and I was studying the pelagic, that means the drifting uh, sargassum community. It's a brown macroalga that floats around on the surface of the Sargasso Sea. And I was towing a, a net on the surface of the ocean and uh, to try to estimate how much uh, sargassum was out there. Uh, first time I took the tow, I caught plastics, but it's one of those things where you don't see the forest for the trees. You know, it wasn't until about the second or the third time that I took the tow uh, that I began to say, everywhere I take a tow in the middle of the ocean, about as far away from land as you can get, I'm picking up plastics. So I started to, I was down on my hands and knees on the deck of the, the ship, you know, separating the sargassum from the plastic. And I um, estimated that there was about 3,500 pieces of plastic per square kilometer out there. And I don't remember how many grams, I think it was something like 400 or some, something like that uh, per square kilometer. And by the way, uh, I also urged um, a sailing education school that's called SEA out of uh, Woods Hole. Uh, they wanted to know some things that they could do to uh, for the students that were on the ship. And I said, well, one very easy thing is to monitor the amount of sargassum and the amount of plastic out there. So they have published papers in recent times showing that there's more than 200,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer in the middle of the, so that went from 3,500 to an average of about 200,000. So when I, I I thought that this was a really big thing and uh, that, that it really ought to get some attention in the scientific journals. So I came back uh, to Woods Hole and I wrote this up a very short article uh, and sent it off to the journal Science. And lo and behold, they published it. And when they published it, the, bio, the, the chairman of the biology department at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution came running into my laboratory with the copy of the science in his hand. And he said, what kind of BS are you publishing? And uh, he, they, they did not like it. Uh, these, these were the older senior scientists. Uh, and I was a junior scientist. I was 29 years old at the time. And so then it's also, I got a telephone call from the president of the Society of Plastics Industry located in the middle of the United States. And he said, I want to talk to you. So he flew out and uh, he basically questioned everything that I did. You know, why is this important? Why did you do this? He never said anything positive about it, about the paper. And he also talked with the senior scientists at the Oceanographic. Um, and I, I did get a few, I got a, bit of an interview in the New York Times uh, in the science section. Uh, I got a few telephone calls from radio stations, uh, talk radio station type things at that time. And, uh, I, but other than that, there I didn't uh, get very much. And some of the um, other colleagues of mine, the junior scientists um, joked about the whole thing. They called me Mr. Plastic, okay, things like that. Um, but I was happy that I published it. And one thing that I put into the abstract was under the current waste disposal practices and plastic generation, uh, this problem is only going to get worse with time. And then what happened is that, that I published that paper in 1972. At the same time, I was working on what happens to the plankton as they go through the cooling water system of a nuclear power plant. Uh, and this was in Connecticut, so maybe about 150, maybe 200 kilometers 
by in a straight line between uh, Woods Hole and where the power plant was. And I was looking at the, the plankton sample and I saw what I thought was a fish egg and I squeezed it with my forceps and it just popped out. And I said, that's not a fish egg, you know? And I began to see a lot of these little spheres, maybe about a half millimeter to about two millimeters in diameter. And then what I, I did was I, I came back to Woods Hole and I threw my plankton net out over the, the bridge in Woods Hole. And I remember looking up at the cod end of the plankton net and it was transparent and I could see those same little balls, the same little spheres uh, right there in Woods Hole. So um, I said, I got on a ship. I knew that there was a boat from the Marine Biological Lab going from Woods Hole to New York City. So I said, could I come along and just sample? you know, throw my plankton net out. And I did, and I, every single place that I put my plankton net out from Woods Hole through Long Island Sound to New York City, I picked up those little plastic balls. Then I looked at um, some of the fish that we collected at that nuclear power plant. And I think I looked at 14 different species of larval or juvenile fish and I can't give you the exact number, but it, something like half of them had those little plastic balls inside of their guts. And it's almost like if a human had swallowed a watermelon, you know, that's how big it, that, that, that was the relative size. So the funny thing is that here I am, the, the senior scientists don't like the, my plastics articles, and I have another one to write. So I wrote that one up. And I sent that off to science and they published it. And again, uh, I got the same response from the senior scientists and the guy from the Society of Plastics Industry flew out again to talk with me about this paper. <laughs> so <clears throat> that, was, that was 1972. And uh, I heard the next year that uh, Woods Hole would not renew my contract. So I left uh, in 1975 and went to another school, um, <coughs> Stony Brook University on Long Island. And I, I realized that I probably wasn't going to make my career with plastics and you know working with constantly with plastics. So I changed, I, I worked a lot on cyanobacteria and nitrogen fixation, things like that. Um, but here and there, um, I did uh, pick up a little bit. I, I had a graduate student recently uh, working on plastics and the uh, biofilm that occurs on the plastics, the biofilm of bacteria and the uptake of um, trace metals on the, those, and into the biofilm. This was in uh, samples from uh, San Francisco Bay. Um, and I also worked a little bit with uh, Five Gyres, which is a NGO that uh, works on um, plastic pollution all over the world. Uh, and uh, this is Marcus Erickson that, that heads uh, Five Gyres with his wife. Um, so I've sort of gotten back into uh, this, but the, the interesting thing is that uh, from 1972 until about 2022, there, it took a long time for the, the uh, people and scientists to recognize that this was a problem. And I think it was about nine, 2010, that if I look at the number of papers published on plastic pollution, approximately in 2010, the numbers started to rise almost exponentially. And I think Part of it was due to the publication, the public publication of um, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch by Charles Moore, and that was in maybe 2004, 2005. Um, and also uh, Richard Thompson, he's a British uh, writer, who, uh, scientist who wrote an article in Science on uh, microfiber plastic pollution, and that was in 2004. So, so by about 2010, the number of papers just started to rise 
exponentially. And people began to realize that uh, this, that the plastics were everywhere, you know, in the air that we breathe, in Arctic uh, sea ice, Antarctic sea ice, um, just literally everywhere that you would look. Um, and in, it's in our blood, it's in our food, it's in our drinking water, it's in the salt. 90% uh, of the salt uh, samples that were analyzed by Greenpeace had uh, microplastics in it. So it's a very pervasive problem. And I think you had another question about <laughs> what we could do about this or some other questions. Uh, one major question that we have is, and, and you've explained how you started this in 1972, and there was a lot of negative feedback um, from various people and organizations. How and why uh, did you manage to continue to work in this in the face of this um, uh, reluctance to embrace your work? Well, I'm, I'm the type of a person uh, that, number one, um, at Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution, they wanted you to become a specialist in one area. I didn't like that. I wanted to keep my options open. I, I'd like to work on fish. I like to work on zooplankton, phytoplankton, different types of phytoplankton. Um, so I, one thing that my PhD advisor instilled into me was that um, you, if you have a broad base uh, of knowledge and um, work areas that you can you can work on, you have a much better chance of getting uh, research funding, um, inspiring different graduate students, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to keep all of my options open. So I figured I will try to um, narrow some of my research on nitrogen fixation and trichodesmium. It's a cyanobacterium that's tropical. Um, and at the same time, I'll also try to uh, keep some of my other interests going uh, on plastics and et cetera. Uh, and other types of pollutants. So I guess it was partly the influence of my PhD advisor. His name was John Hobby. Um, and uh, partly my own uh, interest and in, in joy and looking at uh, a lot of different aspects of marine ecology and oceanography. Um, well, Congratulations on your commitment. Um, we're, we're glad you, you kept going. Um, one thing, as scientists and researchers and educators, we want to raise awareness, but not panic in relation to uh, important information. What suggestions or recommendations do you have for people who try to smoothen the process for new microplastics discovery, its data and their presence? I would say one thing is, um we can do something about this, you know, to, to give them a positive um, uh, aspect, you know, that, okay, we have a problem, but we can do, we can address this problem. And my feeling is that we try to address it uh, by limiting the um, single use plastics at the source. Um, and, uh, there are some others that want to address the problem by going out and cleaning everything up. I think that this is uh, almost a, a Sisyphean task. You're not going to do it unless you address the problem at the source. So we have to do something about limiting the use of single-use plastics um, and let the, you know, the younger people should know that um, Something can be done about this, just as something can be done about uh, uh, our heat trapping gases, and, but we have to work on it. We can't uh, continue with business as usual. And so that, that is a positive thing that they can feel that they, they, can, they can do something about this problem. Um, another thing probably is to make them aware that, uh, for example, drinking water out of a out of a plastic uh, disposable water bottle is not a good idea. Microwaving food and, and plastic is not a good idea. You know, ways that they could limit uh, their exposure to microplastics would be good. 
Um, Ed, thank you so much for joining us today and being prepared to answer our questions. We thank you for your work so far, and hopefully you'll help inspire some uh, more young people to uh, get involved in this activity. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed this. <laughs>